Is a better world possible? The challenges sometimes seem overwhelming. Billions of people have no access to education, health care, clean drinking water, or even basic human rights. Their poverty is compounded by corruption, conflict over resources, economic stagnation, and violence. Some countries, the whole generations of young people are being lost. So the cycle goes on and on. So you have, one has to break that cycle. Where are the solutions? And who are the change makers who can create them? In the past few decades, a powerful force has emerged. New leaders finding new ways to tackle the world's biggest problems. Problems that governments and businesses alone have not been able to overcome. This is a, a, a new language, a new way of looking at the world. Very different structure, different framework. Difference, difference points. This global revolution is led by social entrepreneurs, innovative people who respond to local problems, engage their communities in solving them, and accelerate change. What has happened during the last five years is breathtaking. People have the power of transformation. This series is an opportunity to learn from the most extraordinary social entrepreneurs, people whose visionary ideas and persistence have enabled millions to transform their own lives. These founding members of Ashoka's Global Academy for Social Entrepreneurship have lessons to offer us all about the power of our own potential. They all started small, from humble beginnings. You are invited to share their journeys, learn their insights, and about the tools they use to produce change. We have a window of opportunity of a couple of this years. chance that we have to think ahead. The companies that get this are going to have a huge competitive advantage. Whether you're in business, the media, government, universities, or the social sector, this series will expose you to a new way of thinking and working that will stretch your own beliefs about what's possible and how you can achieve it. The Millennium Development Goals are an unprecedented effort to attack worldwide poverty simultaneously on many fronts. Any development organization working for poverty alleviation and empowerment of the poor needs to really work on many different issues. BRAC, formerly the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, founded by Fazal Hassan Abid, has employed a multi-pronged strategy to attack poverty on a national level. BRAC's work has helped Bangladesh make significant strides. In 1974-75, Bangladesh's fertility per woman was 6.5. And now, nationally, it's about 3. Life expectancy at birth in 1975 was 49, now it's 61. Abed shares BRAC's experience in tackling such goals as establishing universal primary education, promoting gender equality, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, and alleviating poverty. He offers a valuable roadmap to all those engaged in the struggle to reach these critically important goals. The Millennium Development Goal is multifaceted in the sense that it looks at poverty, survival of children, maternal mortality, environment, all kinds of issues. And I think there are very important issues and it requires any development organization working for poverty alleviation and empowerment of the poor or development of their country it needs to really work on many different issues. And BRAC has been one of the pioneers of working on many different facets of life because we, we have looked at human beings as an integrated entity. Their needs are multidimensional. You need better environment to survive and flourish. You need education, you need uh, nutrition, you need health care. And then when you are looking at a human being with these multifaceted needs, we have tried to provide 
the basic services so that human beings can uh, operate as a human person, meet all its needs. Poverty is the number one goal, reduction of poverty. Uh, and I think in this respect, BRAC's main objective is poverty alleviation and empowerment of the poor. And our basic thrust of programming has been to reduce poverty in Bangladesh. It's not just poor people, less than one dollar a day, we are trying to help them, but also the poorest 10% of the population who get less than 35 cents a day, these are the people also we are trying to work with microfinance and uh, asset transfer and healthcare and so on so that they can come out of extreme poverty. So poverty reduction is remains our biggest um, thrust of our programming and we are hoping that large numbers of our very poor people would come out of extreme poverty by the year 2015. But the problem of nutrition in Bangladesh is great. We have problems of mothers who are malnourished producing malnourished babies. A lot of children, almost 40% of our children are born what is called low birth weight. And then again, if you don't provide the right kind of food, then of course uh, the children remain malnourished. When they become adults, if you are sick, then you can earn enough and then therefore you are poor and therefore the next, next generation of children are also malnourished and poor. And so the cycle goes on and on. So you have, one has to break that cycle of poverty and malnutrition and lack of earning power and poverty and malnutrition again. So we have worked on a number of different areas in tackling malnutrition at the child at the maternal level, tackling at the uh, adult level, particularly with microfinance and income and employment generation program to try and get poor people to earn more so that they can feed their uh, children and their family to try and get Bangladesh out of the cycle of poverty and penetration. I think the Millennium Development Goal is a good goal to work for, towards. Uh, most of the goals or targets set uh, is achievable, I think. And in Bangladesh, I think we will try and achieve all of it, all the goals. The first one, of course, is um, education of children, uh, whether we could, we could get all children into school and get them to complete primary education. We felt that, um, you know, if we ultimately had to improve productivity in this country, we needed to get our children educated for the next generation to be able to compete effectively in the globalized market. We have uh, one group, which is 8 to 10. We take them into primary schools and provide them four years of education, which covers five years of primary schooling. And then we have got another group, where mostly girls, but some boys, 10 years to 14 years, those children who, for whatever reasons, have, been, have not had the opportunity to have an education. Since they are, they are older children, we provide them three years of education to cover five years of curriculum, and they can do that. Most of them uh, complete pr five years of primary school, schooling in three years. So we have got these two groups of children who come to our schools. The reason for these schools are that there are many children who don't enroll themselves into any primary school. So we wanted to mop up these children who has never had an opportunity to uh, go to a primary school. So that was one. And secondly, we also found there's a large number of children who went into a primary school, enrolled themselves, but then dropped out without any meaningful learning. So we felt that we also needed to provide them a second chance so that they have an access to education, at least primary level education. The reason we call our school system non-formal primary schools is because if we said they were primary schools, the government has got a particular rule as to how many classes you must have, how many teachers you must have, you must adopt the government curriculum. So we felt that we would be outside the government system. We wanted to experiment with new ways of teaching learning. Uh, we needed to, to develop new curriculum, new materials. So we called uh, our schools non-formal 
But then if you look at the structure of, the, of our schools, they are more formal than the formal schools in the sense that the classes start, particular time is finishes, teachers come on time, uh, the, there is a structure of teaching learning, uh, subjects are taught every day. There are 270 days a year that the classes take place. In most government schools, probably in less than 200 days, classes are held. But we call it non-formal simply because we didn't want to abide by all the rules that is set for a primary school. Our education um, has got another thing which is very attractive in the sense that we involve teachers and parents to come together every month and the parents are given report of how, the, how their children are doing. So they feel happy that uh, the, the teachers are reporting back to them about the progress of their children. And uh, it's part of the system that the parents feel very proud of the achievements of their children and also they feel that this is um, their school. So if the school needs something, the parents are ready to contribute time and resources for improving this improving school uh, whatever resources they need we set up these schools in each village with 30 children and one teacher we thought that these children would be quite happy receiving five years of primary education but we were taken aback quite surprised when we found that 90 percent of our children who completed primary schools actually went on to high school we expanded to 35,000 schools and we have uh, 1.2 million children in our schools. We ourselves fund about 350 NGOs to run BRAC type schools. So I think uh, it has been adopted in Bangladesh quite well. But in Bangladesh, if you look at the statistics, there are 19 million children in the age group of 6 and 10. Approximately 3 million children are out of school right now still not going to school. So if we had more resources, I think we could have, have had 100,000 schools and mopped up all the children who are out of school presently. So because uh, we don't have the resources we need, we, we can't expand to that level. The basic idea was not that we just take one million children and provide education. The idea was that the kind of systems, methods, training of teachers that we developed, if we could transmit part of it to the national system, then we would have been satisfied. But BRAC schools is being looked at by government as a separate entity, and we have nothing to learn from them kind of thing. So I think our real challenge is going to be in the future if you could transmit some of the things that we do in our schools to the national system, building self-confidence in children, teachers training, teachers refresher courses, the materials and curriculum that we have developed. If some of them were transferred to the national system, I think the, the country could benefit dramatically in improving primary education, quality of primary education in our country. That part of it we haven't achieved yet, and we are looking for opportunities to do that. One of the problems of the government primary school system is that may, there are many children enrolled, maybe 80 to 90 children enrolled in one class, and then the primary school doesn't have the space, maybe space for 50, but they're enrolling 90. But ultimately what, what happens is about 50 or 60 children comes into the class, the others remain absent because they can't find space. We felt that maybe we, if we could provide a preschool class for one year before they come to primary schools, then at least the, the basics of alphabet and um, you know numbers up to 100, they, they could at least learn those and also learn some rhymes and so on, which uh, sort of amuses children. So we, we have now set up about 16,000 preschools so that they are prepared to go to a government primary school. I know that the primary school is a very unattractive, very difficult place to survive, but still hopefully the survival rate will go up. And we are also trying to help primary schools uh, in uh, setting up the class which has got 60 or 70 children. We are trying to build another class by the side of the primary school so that it could be divided into two sections. 
so we are now talking with the government and talking with the community. We are also raising money from the community so the primary school could be expanded. Hopefully if it works then we, we can go national again and try and improve primary education in Bangladesh. What we are facing is that our children are coming out of primary schools and going into high schools. The quality of high schools is really bad in Bangladesh. So we have just taken up a program of improving secondary education in Bangladesh. So out of 17,000 secondary schools, we have taken up 1,000 schools to try and improve quality of education. How do you improve quality of education? Basically by training teachers. And we are also training headmasters how to manage a school system, how to get community to support them more and also training the village and the school management committee as to what their responsibilities are, what to look for, how to raise money, things like that, so that the school system works. So hopefully, if we are, if we are successful in doing that, then we can take up a larger program in the next phase, take up all the 17,000 schools and try and improve that. We need to not only get children in schools, but also provide a quality education, and which is not happening in Bangladesh yet, whether it is primary or secondary. So I think basically we need to work on that a lot more. The other goals are women's equity, gender equality, particularly women's role in society. BRAC has been working specifically on a number of areas vis-a-vis uh, -vis women. Almost all of our microfinance clients are women, so we are trying to develop economically our women in Bangladesh. Uh, we, women's education in Bangladesh, we are attaining almost parity in primary education in enrollment of girls and boys. When we started the, our school system, we decided that since majority of the children in primary schools, in the, the government primary schools, are boys, and at that time, the ratio was 65% boys and 35% girls in government schools in, in the late 80s. And we decided that we will reverse that ratio. We'll get 70% girls and 30% boys in our schools. And we found that when we set up a school in a village, it's the boys who would, the parents would bring for education in our schools. But we said, no, in this village, unless we get 70% girls, we won't even start a school here. So parents were forced to bring in their girls who didn't go to school before into our schools because, because that was one way of getting more girls into our schools. And we also felt that girls' education, if it is going to be primary education, girls' education is in fact more important for child survival, for welfare of the family than boys' education. We felt that uh, these 11 to 14-year-old children whom we have in our schools we felt that if they didn't pursue education further, if they didn't go to secondary schools, we felt that we needed to get them to retain their literacy and interest in education, even when they left our non-formal primary schools. So we started to organize clubs for them. Uh, so every, every week they've got a club day, and one of the primary schools is designated for, uh, for the what we call Kishori clubs. So they come in, borrow books, play uh, various kinds of games that we have provided them. And so the clubs uh, ultimately became quite a hub of activities for these young, young girls who graduated from our schools. And later on we decided that these adolescent girls, ultimately they will get married and they will become uh, mothers and so on. So why shouldn't we give them some training as to what they are going for. So training on uh, child health, their own health. Then some of them said that we want to do something professionally. So some of them were also became photographers. So all kinds of training started, poultry, livestock, fisheries, uh, all kinds of things. Then later on they said we want to borrow money to, uh, to get into various kinds of enterprises. So we have got a small fund now reserved for young adolescent girls. We are also providing human rights and legal education to women so that they, are, they can assert their rights uh, in the villages. And we provide also legal aid for any violence against women 
when a woman is divorced, the husband doesn't provide anything for the, for the children, and we are taking them to court so that uh, uh, that they get, receive allowances for for children's education and costs of uh, running families, so that they are not totally borne by women. So we are trying to take women's sides in almost every activity that we do. Even lately, we have started training women journalists, so that we will have in the media a fairly substantial number of women who would represent the causes of women in the countryside. So BRAC has been working fairly largely on women's empowerment and women's economic development. When we started health program in Bangladesh, we started with curative program, basically doctors looking after patients. But we realized that just curative service is not going to change the disease pattern in Bangladesh. We need to look at how to control diseases, how to prevent diseases. So basically, the idea of immunization of children so that they get less disease, family planning services so that women don't suffer from other things associated with births, water and sanitation is another area that we worked in. So we we have now provided all kinds of preventive medicine. For most of our health programs now, we need involvement of our group members because if they have to improve the sanitation and water, their participation is essential. Initially, they came as passive recipients of curative services from our doctors. I don't think we now provide many things ourselves. Most of them are embedded in their own communities. So the health worker that we have trained, she's within the community and they pay for the services. Um, and uh, they improve their own condition as they see fit. In our basic health program, what we call essential health care program, our Shaisto the um, village health workers, they are providing basic services like antenatal care for every pregnancy is being monitored, postnatal care, some basic nutrition, folic acid and iron for every pregnant woman. So she's a group member, so she will be borrowing money to do whatever activities she has. She may have two cows and uh, five goats, and she has other things that she does. But on top of that, she also serves the community in health care. So she probably gives two to three hours a day in the task of village health worker. So various kinds of health commodities we supply to her, and she has a small markup so that she can get some income out of it. For that, I suppose she will be respected in the community as a village doctor, but we don't pay any salary to them. If we paid salary to them, what will happen is that if BRAC were to stop it, they will stop their work. So we felt that we needed to develop somebody in the, within the community so she will go on serving the community as long as she is capable. Community health center, I think we have got about a hundred community health centers. Usually we have a doctor and a paramedic and some other assistant staff who man these community health centers. They are basically curative services and also d um, delivery. Uh, births take place in these community health centers. Uh, one idea was that we should try and get women to deliver in a hospital kind of setting so that maternal mortality is reduced. In Bangladesh, most births take place in the home. The other idea was that our paraprofessionals, like the village health worker, if she referred somebody, they could see a doctor and then get uh, drugs for, for whatever reasons they, they need to come to a doctor. We do um, allow everybody to come into this health center. For our group members who are poor people, they pay a small fee of 10 taka to see a doctor and get medicine. But then if you are an outsider and can pay more, you are charged 20 taka. We have started a small pilot project on health insurance. Um, we haven't really evaluated that yet. When we started health insurance in the 70s, we were not quite happy with that in the sense that the poorest people didn't come to our insurance program. But now Bangladesh's per capita income is probably twice what it was in the 1970s. So I think it's time now to look at it again and see whether or not poorest people would come to health insurance. 60 to 80 percent of our costs are recovered from fees. So we are still looking for a 100 percent cost recovery in our 
community health centers. Once we have attained that, then of course we don't need to uh, put in more money or seek more funding from donors and so on. So then we can go on expanding and then provide better service. The other goals, one of them is child survival. Can we get child mortality reduced to less than half of what it was in the year 2000? I think we will attain that. I think um, child survival is on track in the sense that we are trying to immunize all children. Oral rehydration is working quite well. We will try and get uh, the mortality from pneumonia uh, controlled. Uh, so I think uh, child survival will probably attain that also. There are many companies now making packets of oral rehydration salts which could be mixed with water and then given to children when they have diarrhea. But um, if we didn't do the teaching to mothers how to make oral rehydration fluid, the packet distribution would not have been uh, very efficacious in the sense that they wouldn't have known how to mix oral rehydration salts with water. What we did was teaching mothers how to measure water and how to mix things. Now that we have taught how to measure water, half a liter of water in every household, they know what to do now that the packets are available. But then our biggest contribution, which probably improved child survival dramatically, was the immunization program. We took up half the country and immunized all children in the late 80s. Since then, we have been asked by government to help improve uh, immunization program in the government setup and we have helped them in improving immunization coverage. So I think in terms of impact, probably our work on immunization has had greater impact in improving child survival and health for children than anything else that we have done so far. The most difficult one is maternal mortality reduction. In Bangladesh, it is quite high. It's about 300 per 100,000. Every 100,000 births, 300 mothers die. BRAC has worked for the, over the last 10 years trying to get maternal mortality reduction in Bangladesh. Reproductive health is one of our largest programs. We are training doctors in hospitals to take cases, difficult delivery cases. We are also trying to get women to be more aware of when they need to go to hospitals. So we have been working on this, um, but this is the most difficult one in the sense that in the remote villages where you have obstructed deliveries, there is very little chance that the woman can actually go to a hospital on time and get delivered and this, then she is safe. So it, it is a difficult one, but I think we are all working on this and we could, will probably attain that. I think in 1975, when Bangladesh is contraceptive prevalence rate was 5 to 7 percent. BRAC attained in one area, inshallah, where we started, uh, some 22 percent contraceptive prevalence rate. So we attained the highest level of um, contraceptive prevalence rate in Bangladesh in the, in the 70s. But in the 90s and now, contraceptive prevalence rates in Bangladesh, throughout Bangladesh, is about 50 percent. And I think in most of our project areas, it's probably around 65%. And if you have a 65% prevalence rate, then of course you are only getting women who wish to have a child are having children. So more or less in the BRAC project area, we will be coming to a level where birth rate will go down to two and a half to three per women. So that is happening already in Bangladesh. The transition from high fertility to low fertility already is taking place. The other thing that I thought in the 80s, that unless we reduce infant and child mortality, we are not going to have a low fertility. So it also helped reducing infant mortality and child mortality. Families are happy that their children are surviving. They don't need to have too many children in order to have at least a few surviving. So that's also helped. Uh, in 1974, 75, I think Bangladesh's um, fertility per woman was 6.5. And now, nationally, it's about 3. We need to go to 2.2 in order to have 
replacement level fertility rate. So we have got a, some way to go. Point eight per woman we need to reduce. And we are hoping to, that we should be able to do that by the year 2015. If we have that, then Bangladesh's population is still going to rise to about 2060. And then we'll level off. So water, sanitation, reproductive health, basic health care for children. If you can ensure that, then I think our infant mortality rate will go down sufficiently enough and we'll also uh, raise the uh, life expectancy at birth. Uh, life expectancy at birth in 1975 was 49, now it's 61. So we hope that by the end of this decade, we'll, we'll attain life expectancy of about 70 in Bangladesh. And that will be mainly by cutting down infant mortality and maternal mortality and morbidity. On control of uh, diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis, BRAC has, is already involved in eradication, if not eradication, control of tuberculosis in Bangladesh and we have got a fairly large program covering the entire country. We have just received about $45 million from the Global Fund for Tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS and Malaria and we have got a program now going all over the country. So we've got about 50,000 women we call Shastoshebikas, which are the rural health workers. And these women also provide services to the community uh, in curative and preventive health care. But also we are using them to identify tuberculosis cases. So we ask them to go to 20 households every day and ask them whether anybody is coughing for three weeks or more. If they are coughing for three weeks or more, we collect their sputum and we take it to a laboratory to find out whether or not they've got tuberculosis. So once we identify tuberculosis, then we provide treatment. We are trying to cover the entire country with this. Malaria is another uh, area that we could work in and we have already submitted a proposal to the Global Fund for malaria control, in particularly in border areas of Bangladesh which has malaria. We don't have a lot of malaria within the country but in the border areas only. HIV AIDS, we, are, we don't have a big problem yet but we have now taken up a program of consciousness raising about HIV, how it's transmitted and how once you got it then what happens. In fact, HIV AIDS, we are working with both boys and girls uh, in high schools. Uh, we think that these are the younger generation who are likely to ultimately contract. We, we don't have a large number of uh, infections yet in Bangladesh, but we think that it is going to come unless we are careful. Uh, India has got very high levels of HIV and AIDS infection. So we are trying to get the young people to understand how to protect themselves. But I think also very vulnerable groups like uh, sex workers, truck drivers, people like that, these are the ones that we are also trying to focus our attention on how to protect themselves. And we are doing rural drama now, where in, particularly in bus stands where lots of people who travel a lot congregate. So we are trying to do the best we can at this moment. On environment, we are, we are working on safe water, safe drinking water solution for Bangladesh. Of course, Bangladesh was lucky in getting tube wells um, sunk during the 70s, 80s and 90s. So most people have access to safe drinking water. But then we have a problem of arsenic contamination in our groundwater. We have done a survey of how many tube wells in Bangladesh has arsenic uh, contamination. And we are trying to find alternative source of water. We are planting a millions of trees in Bangladesh every year. We have got about 15,000 women who do nurseries. Each of them do about 10 to 15,000 saplings, which we promote throughout our, our organization, our 4 million borrowers. They all plant trees throughout the year. And apart from that, we also have our own nurseries. Last year, I think BRAC itself produced about 2.5 million uh, saplings, but then our group members do much more. 10,000 women doing 12,000 saplings. It's a large number, huge number of saplings which are distributed to our group members who then plant these trees. Breck has just done a study on 
medical waste disposal in hospitals in Bangladesh. So we found that a large amount of medical waste are being disposed without any protection. So we are now working with hospitals in Dhaka to try and get all the hospitals to come up together to buy incinerators so that they could dispose the medical waste. So we, so we are working on a number of different issues on uh, protecting our environment and uh, pollution. Dhaka is going to be the fourth or fifth largest city in the world in 2020. Um, it has got uh, 13 million people now, but it's supposed to have about 24 million people by the year 2020. And there are lots of slums, almost uh, half our, our people live in slums. But we have got a company, Brack Concord Lands Limited, which is trying to get lands developed so that uh, poor and lower middle class people could find plots of land which they could build on. But it, this is going to be the most difficult one of the Millennium Development Goals, particularly in Dhaka City, to try and uh, meet. The other goal, of course, is, is to mobilize more resources by donors. And I think at this moment we have something like 55 billion uh, development assistance is flowing from donor countries to uh, developing countries. And a friend of mine, Jeffrey Sachs, um, the economist, worked out that we need something like $150 billion annually to be transferred so that Millennium Development Goal could be achieved. Um, even if we receive $100 billion annually, I think it will be, uh, it, it, be possible to achieve Millennium Development Goals. So I think the donors need to also think of increasing their contribution to overseas development. Some countries are already doing that, but uh, many others are staying put at the same level that they committed before. But UN, of course, would like that 0.7% of the GDP of donor countries should be transferred to developing countries, and I hope that in course of time we'll see that this happens. It is a small sum compared to what is spent on defense budgets of, of developed countries. Uh, I, I know my friend um, James P. Grant used to talk about that a lot. Uh, as to what it costs to save uh, 1,000 children less than one-tenth uh, of a jet plane and things like that. But I know that this is a microscopic fraction of what developed countries spend on defense budget. The eighth Millennium Development Goal is, is, to, is the donor countries to reduce subsidies in their own countries so that Africa and developing countries in Asia can, can become viable in agricultural production and can export agricultural produce to developed countries at a much cheaper price than if the developed countries went on supporting their farmers with large amount of subsidy. In the 1980s, we looked at the um, feasibility for a dairy plant in Bangladesh because at that time also the prices of milk were very depressed, simply because Europe was dumping low-priced milk into Bangladesh because farms were subsidized by European Union. So in the 90s, after Maastricht Treaty, when Europe decided to lift subsidy from milk, then we thought that it will be possible for BRAC to get into dairy production. Now that European Union is lifting subsidies, the price of milk powder has gone up and our farmers are now viable. When it was dumped, we couldn't have done this uh, milk plant because it was cheaper to buy powder milk in tins than it was, pos it was possible to buy uh, you know, pasteurized milk in Bangladesh. So that was one of the problems and I think it still remains one of the problems that agriculture subsidy in the developed countries is harming production in, developed, in developing countries. Millennium Development Goal doesn't have everything in it. Uh, it has only provided a guideline for achieving certain uh, targets in certain sectors. But then, in order to achieve those, there are many other things that needs to be done in a society. Getting better public service, 
better delivery, eradicate corruption or reduce corruption, uh, better governance. Better governance is very much related to Millennium Development Goal because in order to attain that, you need to have a better governed society, more equitably distributed resources. You're unlikely to achieve Millennium Development Goal with when the country is not well governed. Bangladesh is, is a democratic country in the sense that we have an elected government in power. But most elections in Bangladesh, we have been having elections since the British time, 1940s. But then most of the elections, the voting was done on the basis of the village headmen telling the people to vote for particular individuals, and they voted. So it was not really individuals exercising their rights and judgment as to who should be the best um, candidate to vote for. What is happening in Bangladesh with all the activities with the poor people that we are doing, PRAC, Grameen, all kinds of other NGOs who are organizing people for power. For the first time, people at the grassroots are waking up and exercising some amount of judgment as to what kind of people should be elected. So I see in the future, in the 10, 15, 20 year kind of time frame, the kind of people we have leaders now, elected leaders, their character is going to change. There is going to be much more grassroots level people who have served their constituencies well. They are the ones who are going to be elected. Once these people are organized and know how to exercise their rights through the electoral process, this is coming up in Bangladesh. So our democracy will be much more strengthened through the process that we have started with working in the countryside, organizing people for power.
In the early 1970s, the newly independent country of Bangladesh was reeling under the effects of war, flood, and famine. Fazal Hassan Abid organized a relief effort that was quickly transformed into something very different. We came to the conclusion that relief and rehabilitation is not going to be enough. It has to be a long-term commitment to development. People who are poor and going to remain poor unless we bring about change. Abid understood that one does not simply develop people. People must develop themselves. Through the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, now simply known as BRAC, he has enabled millions of people to break away from poverty. Poor people are poor because they are powerless. You must organize people for power. They must organize themselves in such a way that they can change their lives. In this program, Abit shares his story and that of BRAC as it has grown from a small group of dedicated staff members to a giant non-government organization of over four million members, which continues to be a guiding light for all who take on the task of global development. Uh, at that time, there was a Brazilian uh, educator named Paulo Freire, whose book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, was published in 1973. And I think early in 73, I read that book. He was, uh, his thesis was that the poor people uh, are poor because they are powerless. You must organize people for power. They must organize themselves in such a way they must understand the dynamics of their communities in such a way that they can change their lives. So that book sort of provided a theoretical uh, framework for us to try and develop people for power. So we set up a whole 100 lessons in which we sort of started building self-worth in people. And through that process, you build self-confidence that they can change their condition and they don't have to live in poverty and degradation forever. We go into a village, a, a field worker. We call him a program organizer. He goes into a village and organizes maybe half a dozen people, maybe 15 or 16 people, and says that you form a group. And then you bring in more people till you are about... 30 to 40, and then a, a, a village group is in existence. And then once we have got this 40 people in a village organization, we call them, then we start other programs, programs like uh, saving starts in even before the group is complete. But once the group is complete, then of course we'll provide um, credit. We'll also provide some training programs like um, legal education so that they understand their rights and obligations. In each village we have one, two or three groups of 40 women. Uh, so about 10 groups to one PO. Uh, in an average area office I think we have got about uh, 20 POs. The 20 POs will look after about 200 groups. 200 multiplied by 40 it could be as many as about 8,000. So area office will cover about seven to 8,000 group members. So you replicate throughout the country and you have uh, 4.5 million groups. BRAC, formerly the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, is the largest non-government organization in Bangladesh and in the world. Fazal Hassan Abed is its founder. A country like Bangladesh with 130 million people, you need to have large-scale programs, otherwise uh, you don't bring about any significant change. BRAC's 30,000 staff members serve over 4 million members with health care, nutrition, microfinance, legal aid, and other services. Over a million children attend BRAC's non-formal primary schools, and only 20% of its work is funded by donors. There's a market perspective in everything. 
including in, even in development programs. You'll find that there is thinking about whether we want to do this at this cost or something alternative at that cost. These are being looked at all the time. Abed shares with us his views on why it's so vital to think big, how to properly lay the groundwork, how to guide the process, how to employ important checks and balances. He demonstrates the importance of involving everyone to work toward a single higher goal. In the 70s, there was, there was a, a book by Schumacher, Our Small is Beautiful. It encapsulated a thinking about any program which is big is not very good. I mean, the small is, is beautiful. It was somewhat a Gandhian kind of principles that uh, big means a, a big factory where people are dehumanized. Small is beautiful in the sense that you do things, you produce things yourselves and so on. But we felt that in terms of development programs, Whatever you do in Bangladesh, if it is too small, it's insignificant. It doesn't solve the problem of Bangladesh. We decided that if you want to tackle poverty of, a, of the country like Bangladesh with 130 million people, you need to have large-scale programs. Otherwise, uh, you don't bring about any significant change. So that became our motto, that small is beautiful, but uh, large-scale is absolutely essential in Bangladesh. If you look at the first eight years of BRAC, after 1980, we had 300 staff. And uh, by 1990, the next 10 years, we had about 3,000 staff. By the year 2000, the next 10 years, we had grown to about 20,000. And now we have more than 30,000 staff, and we are adding probably about 5,000 staff every year. BRAC works in microfinance, where we have got 4.2 million borrowers. And uh, this year we have lent about uh, $450 million. We are working in uh, developing agriculture, livestock, fisheries. We have uh, programs in education. We are providing primary education to 1.2 million children. I think the first thing, of course, uh, when you want to go s to scale, you must be determined to bring about change in a significant way. Um, I've, I have found that uh, not many development organizations think big, think national. That's the biggest problem, I think. When I started BRAC, I didn't have any notion that BRAC will become the largest non-governmental organization in the world. Our idea was that we will work in small uh, pilot projects and the expansion and replication will be done by other entities. We got the idea of national replication when once we developed our program in oral rehydration where we visited all the houses in, in, in Bangladesh and we felt confident that we could replicate our programs. Whatever we did, we could go national. Success as a Brazilian toy manufacturer led Oded Grajev to launch a nationwide campaign to end child labor. He has since become one of the world's leading advocates for corporate social responsibility and a champion of people's ability to create change. We must not forget that power today is concentrated in governments and a great deal in businesses. Now, governments and businesses depend on people. In 2001, Grajev founded the World Social Forum, an annual gathering of more than 150,000 of the world's leading citizen groups who work together to address some of the world's most pressing issues. The World Social Forum is not just an event, an occurrence, nor is it an organization. It is a process. It is a process of forming ideas of another society, another world. In this program, he describes how the World Social Forum has grown and generated hundreds more gatherings worldwide, each expanding this powerful new model for social action. He offers his experience on how to stimulate systemic change in the way we live, 
work, and govern. The World Social Forum has great potential to save mankind from the great social and environmental disaster that is on our threshold if we believe all the forecasts from scientists, universities, the United Nations, and the social organizations. We can indeed move towards sustainable development to a world of peace, solidarity, and environmental preservation. This is the more optimistic outlook. Often human beings, people, organizations, and countries act after great disasters. After the disaster, we begin to think, well, let's change our lives. Many people in hospitals decide to quit smoking. Many people decide after their child leaves home to have a better relationship with their children. Many businessmen, after great problems, decide to change company management. In the case of mankind, if the disaster happens, there won't be actions afterwards because the disaster is a disaster of enormous magnitude. The great challenge, the great risk of the World Social Forum movement is for it to become a movement and a process already known and traditional in the other world, this current world that we already know, and not be the movement of another transforming world. This is a great risk that exists for any social organization. Any social entity that intends to be a transforming entity. Social organizations, the great transforming social entities, are always created by a small group, usually very idealistic, very bold, very creative, that manages to build a transforming organization. Often that organization begins to gain recognition, to grow. And the great risk is for the energy that was directed toward that mission begins little by little to turn to the actual organization. The question is no longer what is good for achieving that mission, but what is good for the welfare of that organization. The organization becomes an end in itself, and the mission ends up being more and more forgotten. Another great risk is to transform the energy that was directed towards the mission into energy for the political struggle to control the organization. Another great risk is when the organization grows and is acknowledged. Doors begin to open. There is more space and recognition, which makes the organization become more and more conservative, more like the establishment, because it doesn't want to lose its recognition. It loses courage, avoids conflict, does not want to displease anyone, and ends up being more a conservative than a transforming organization. They are risks that involve not only the World Social Forum, but I think any social organization that has the idea and the mission to be transforming and improve the world. Mohammed Yunus created Grameen Bank, a bank tailored for poor people in response to crushing poverty in his newly created country of Bangladesh. Poverty is not caused by the poor people. Poverty is caused by the system we built. Poverty is caused by the policies that we pursue. Grameen Bank has made a significant contribution to reducing poverty in Bangladesh. Since Grameen's creation in the 1970s, life expectancy has risen more than 20 years. The fertility rate has been cut in half. It is estimated that each year, 200,000 Grameen members and their families escape poverty. The question is, where do we end up 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? We did something wrong and the poverty is created. So let's do something right so that poverty disappears. Dr. Yunus traces the growth of microfinance into a worldwide movement. 
He shares his vision for using it to meet the Millennium Development Goals and to create a poverty-free world. He describes what it will take from all of us to enable microfinance to reach its global potential. Uh, to me, poor people are like uh, bonsai, like the bonsai tree, little tree. Uh, you pick the uh, seed of the tallest tree in the forest and then take the best seed out of that and plant it in a flower pot. You got a tiny little tree and call it a bonsai. Nothing wrong with the seed. We got the best seed possible. Nothing wrong with the tree because we picked the tallest tree in the forest. But actually it grows this far. Why? because we put them into a flower pot, the base. Society is the base. And society is so stingy, it doesn't give them this, the poor people space to grow. So I said, change the base. If you change the base, anybody will be as tall as anybody else. My belief is poverty is not caused by the poor people. Poverty is caused by the system we built. Poverty is caused by the policies that we pursue. So if this is my conclusion, I have to prove that this is true. So I built Grameen Bank as an institution, a bank, but a different kind of bank. You say, there are banks, why did you create another one? Well, I said, this kind of bank doesn't exist. That bank created poverty. These banks get them out of poverty. We assume that some people will always remain poor. I'm always asked in Bangladesh, you talk about having a poverty-free world, are you crazy? Even the richest country in the world, United States, they have poor people there. I said, look, no matter how rich you get, in the present system, you'll have poor people. So I'm trying to change that system. In that system, there will be no poor people because people are as capable as anybody else.